Good evening and welcome to the Long Covid Clinic, What You Can Do, the Fireside Chat series with me, Dr Benita Kane, in partnership with the lovely Helen Oakley, who you can see here next to me, who's a patient, advocate and founding member of the charity Long Covid Support, who are helping us and our partner charity uh, with this series. Over the next few months, we have got a series of fantastic guests lined up who are either treating patients with long COVID or are innovating in this space. And we are hoping to bring you both established treatments, but also things that are in development like the chat this evening. If you can't stay for the whole thing, don't worry. We know people have lots of different uh, disabilities with long COVID, including cognitive dysfunction. So it is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, pretty soon afterwards. So Helen, we're going to put you backstage if that's OK. You're going to be working away in the background, uh, keeping an eye on the chat. This is a live and interactive session. So everyone, if you could put any questions you have in the chat, we'll be keeping an eye on those. We'll hopefully be coming to those um, at the end of the discussion. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm delighted to introduce um, our guest this evening. So that is Professor Andrew Shaw. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Prof Shaw is at the University of Exeter, specialising in physical chemistry and biochemistry. He's also an academic entrepreneur and has founded two companies, the latest of which is Atamarca, where he is CEO and founder. Uh, today we're going to talk about a test that's been developed in his research group during the PhD thesis of Dr. Philip James Pemberton. This research was funded by the University of Exeter alumni donations, sponsorship from Atamarca and also Recognition Health, uh, their partner clinic for long COVID in London. Uh, so welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Benita. And thank you very much for letting me be your first guest. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and I think you first came onto my radar by a couple of colleagues who are very interested in the concept of viral persistence. And um, I've been following your work with interest. So as a clinician, um, I'm looking after quite a number of patients now with long COVID and I see very different sort of clinical syndromes and how patients present. Quite interested, you as a biochemist, um, What's your view on long COVID and, and what's causing it? So uh, I am definitely a biochemist. I'm definitely a scientist. I'm not a medic. And that means I'm looking for a mechanism, I'm looking for something that's going to explain why there are over 250 sy symptoms associated with the long COVID syndrome. What can possibly be causing all of those symptoms? And that's why I like the persistent virus uh, hypothesis that says, the virus, which is really rather small, can be everywhere in your body and can affect your heart, your brain, your lungs, etc. So persistent virus has the right mechanistic feel about it. And how, how small is the virus, Andrew? Like just to give us a scale of, of, of why and how it gets into every tissue in our bodies. So SARS-CoV-2 has been around for about three years now. It's about a ten thousandth of the size of the human hair. So it means it will readily go between cells, it would get into cells, it would get into bacteria in your gut, it would get into the, uh, the mucosal lining of your nose and your lungs, and it's, it's been, going, been seen to go through the blood-brain barrier and has been seen in um, pretty much everywhere around the body, although it's hard to sample and measure accurately. And that's, again, my biochemical instinct is I've got to make, make some measurements properly. Yeah, so one of the challenges about the viral persistence theory is it's actually extremely difficult to prove live replicating virus. So you need tissue and you need to then have that tissue in an environment where you can prove the, the virus is there and, and live. So although we found bits of the virus in every tissue in the body, no one, as I'm aware as of yet, has proven this live virus in tissues. Um, is that your understanding as well? Yeah, so live virus is a very interesting concept, but imagine your, uh, the sampling problem is huge. Imagine you're sat on the beach and you put a cup into the sea and get a cup of water. You probably look into that cup and conclude there are no fish in the sea and certainly no sharks. So if you don't sample your part of the body uh, carefully, you're not going to find the virus. And the virus at 90 nanometers, this, this fraction of a hair's breadth can be anywhere and it can be sitting around doing nothing. So if it's replicating, 
then there may be lots of viral DNA, uh, viral RNA around the viral DNA around. If it's inside a sick cell, then yes, you can see the sick region. It'll it'll recruit fluid and, and bacterial uh, and, and uh, immune system cells. But also the viral, the DNA hangs around. And um, like dinosaur DNA, it can be in your body for a while, but not in any way associated with the virus. Yeah, okay. And so I think in order to kind of understand some of the work that you're doing, we probably need to really get back to the basics of immunology, which it's been a long time since I studied immunology at university. Um, so it'll be a good good reminder and a lesson for me. Um, so I know this is a, supposed to be a chat, but we, we, we are going to bring some pictures up because this is quite difficult to understand, I think, for the lay audience. Um, so can you can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the virus works. It looks like this, and these little red things are the the spike protein. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, it won't become a lecture, but uh, this is this is a, uh, a an image of the of the uh, virus. The uh, red bits are the spike proteins, and they are over the surface of the virus. Maybe fifty to uh, forty to fifty of those on the surface, and it's these little red dots, especially the bits at the end, the fluffy bits at the end, that, that then interact with your cells in your body through a front door that's on some of your cells called the ACE2 receptor. It docks. It's a really specific interaction, like a key going into a lock. And then the virus squirts its RNA into your cell and infects the cell. So the basic infection mechanism is a clear docking that lasts for some time between the spike protein on the, on the surface and the ACE2 receptors on some of your cells in the body. And then it kind of hijacks the cell's machinery and makes copies of itself and then spews that out. So it's really clever in how it works, isn't it? And then it's carried around the body through the bloodstream where it can even infect the blood vessels and cause inflammation in pretty much any part of the body that way as well. So a single infected cell might make thousands, even hundreds of thousands of particles. Um, it quickly, however, signals the fact that there's a virus in the cell and puts a, um, a, an infected signal on the cell surface, and that begins to recruit the immune system. Things like the T cells recognize that signal and, uh, and then go in and start to kill the cell. So the acute infection is cleared by those T cells that recognize the infected cell as being infected because the cell reports that. But yeah, it's, once it's replicated, it can go everywhere in large quantities, back into your nose, then you sneeze it out, and then you spread it. I mean, I, I've, I've been... Um talking to a colleague who's very interested in the, the role of saliva and, and and it going directly into the blood through the, the oral cavity. And he was saying that there's five million copies of the virus in a in a teaspoon of saliva, which was quite um yeah, I mean I know it <laughs> I know there's a lot of virus around, but that was quite shocking to think about how many yeah. copies there are. And and um, you, you make a lot of saliva as well, sometimes somewhere between half a litre and one and a half litres a day. Um, yeah. And what, what makes a super spreader? We don't know that. We don't know whether the amount of light makes, uh, protects you somehow and whether that causes the, um, the, 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 the super spreader characteristics. No good test for a super spreader, a super spreader at all. Yeah. Apologise to anyone who's having their uh, dinner while we're discussing <laughs> large volumes of saliva. I'm really <laughs> sorry. It might be good to watch this one catch up if you are. Um, OK, so we've talked about the virus getting into the cell. We've talked about this recruitment of an army of T cells that will then come and try and clear that virus from the body. Um, and they need to be able to recognize um, that the fact that it's an infective cell, a sick cell. Where do antibodies fit into that this? Because that's a different part of the immune system, isn't it? So uh, the T cells might be the army going into to kill the enemy. I think that's a good analogy. But after the enemy has been killed, I think you need a standing army or a police force to look over the body, check that the um, order has been resumed and the infection has been cleared away, and you come back to being normal, healthy. And I think that's the process that perhaps hasn't worked properly in long COVID. So you need to sterilize your body. You need to get a sterilizing serum uh, that goes throughout your body. And then the, the antibody is a billion times more concentrated than T cells. It hangs around for longer. The T cells also, if they're not active, begin to get uh, switched off. And so you get this standing army of antibodies that go around clearing up the virus for quite the period. I mean, the half-life of the antibody may be 200 days or something. So for quite a while after the infection, and maybe that's what determines how fast you get better and uh, whether you get better uh, slow or fast from, a, from, a, from an infection. Okay, and this whole mechanism can go wrong in, in a number of ways, can't it? So firstly, you might not get a good T-cell response. 
Um, so that might be if your immune system is in some way faulty or perhaps you um, are immunosuppressed, you're on drugs that cause immunosuppression, which is why we do worry about our immunosuppressed patients being more vulnerable to infection. Um, are those the kind of two main reasons why you wouldn't mount a good response? Somehow uh, there's a spectrum of response. Um, some people do mount very good responses and we'll see some of those later on. There's a, a good, bad spectrum. And then uh, people at the bottom maybe uh, make very poor responses. Maybe they are immunocompromised. It's a complex process. You have to make good quality antibodies. You have to mature the antibodies to, to make sure they work properly. Similar feedback mechanisms work for the T cells. And if, you, if they go wrong or they're not optimized properly, then you're gonna end up with a sluggish response. And one of the ways in which you get a good immune response is, is A, by getting infected. So if you get infected, then your body can recognise the virus again, but also by getting vaccinated. So that's how vaccines work. They'll introduce a little bit of the, the spike. Your, your T cells can then sort of recognise um, that. And if it encounters it again, you create antibodies. Um, so, so I'm just trying to, before we move into the, the pictures of your test and, and explaining that, um, can you explain where vaccines fit in here? So um, the messenger RNA vaccines uh, for Pfizer and Moderna that are out there at the moment um, infect some cells in your arm and they put the message for the spike protein into your cells. They then replicate that and you end up expressing some spike proteins uh, in your arm. Your immune system recognises those and says, I don't know what this is. This is foreign. I will try and raise an antibody to those spike proteins and I'll also raise T cells. And so the vaccine starts that process. Um, over time, you forget that a bit, certainly the antibody levels. And so you want to uh, be revaccinated re and, and boosted. And then you get a memory of what you should make. So I've got a recipe now for the antibodies that's stored in the B cell. If I see the virus again, I go back and check the recipe book and I know what to make. So if I make the right recipe, then Antibodies are made really quickly after a second um, challenge uh, within a couple of days or so. And then the standing army becomes really uh, strong. And same for the T cells, they get upregulated and, and then we go into battle quickly. And the second infection ought to be uh, much less of a problem for you. So uh, And so you won't go to hospital. You should uh, shake it off, hopefully, uh, quite quickly. In both of my infections I had, I, I, it felt like a hangover and I was... Um, better in, in three days or so. So hopefully that means I have reasonable antibodies and reasonable T cells. Yeah, and just to pick up on something you said earlier, the the, vac the mRNA vaccines don't actually introduce virus into the local cells, but they will program your cells to create a copy of the spike protein, just to be clear on that point. Yeah, they introduce the viral uh, message, yes. Uh, the sorry, message the, message, the message of protein. Yeah. OK, so let's talk. Let's go on to your test, because this is a bit I think people will be really interested in. So hopefully that it will start making a bit more sense. Now we've talked about the immune response in general. So um, what, are you sh what, what are you showing us here? So now, now you need to see the molecules. This is the biochemistry view of what's going on. So the, the purple bit is the back of the antibody and the red and the blue bits are the top of the antibody. And so they choose a patch, a really small patch of the protein to stick to. And so this is what the spike protein looks like. From so this the is the spike. Can, can, I, can you see my arrow moving around there? Or not? Uh, mine, I'm moving an arrow around, I, I can't. But um, the, the, the light blue at the bottom here, that's the Wuhan spike protein structure. And the red dots in that are some mutations for the alpha variant. So your body chooses a patch. It says, I think this is a good part of the protein to stick to. That will mean I make good antibodies to this region that will stop it binding to the ACE2 receptor. That's my neutralizing antibody. That's what's got to work well. And so it sticks and it must stay there for a while. It can't drop off and it needs to stay there for two or three hours so that it can say, I found this virus, uh, bring in the, uh, the innate immune system, bring in the white blood cells, and then we can get rid of the virus before it infects the cell. So that's the sterilizing bit. So the number of antibodies and how well they stick suddenly becomes an interesting characteristic of, of getting better. Okay, so the test that you've, um, you and Dr. Uh, James has have developed is looking at 11 different um, types of virus. So, sorry, not virus, COVID, <laughs> the different strains of COVID. 
and you've looked at both how well people are producing antibodies to those different strains but also how good those antibodies are like how effective they are um so, yeah, so, so, so we've taken the spike protein from 11 variants starting at wuhan the escape variant alpha delta some lots of omicron variants including the one xbb15 that's circulating at the moment and the virus has been around with us for a while and has mutated and so this spike protein is not what it was when it started and the target's been moving and so do your antibodies work against this moving target and that's really quite important so when you get sick it depends on when you uh, got sick as to which variant you saw so if you got sick early in the pandemic you would have been exposed to the wuhan version of the spike protein if you got uh, sick a bit later in the pandemic you may have been exposed to the omicron variant and ideally your antibody should work against all of those. If not, you might have a problem. Okay, so going back to that previous slide you showed, um, if your antibody is attaching to that particular patch, but uh, the virus is mutated, it you know it might not work against that new strain. And then if you go to the next slide where you know the the timing of when you got sick with the infection that led to long COVID is probably quite key to interpreting the results of what you're testing right yeah so i think there's a scenario where people have long COVID associated with wuhan or long COVID associated with omicron and that means they got sick with the omicron variant and the antibodies uh that they had at the time meant the omicron variant wasn't cleared and that could then lead to persistence and that patch you talked about uh, on the surface, if that has gone because the variant has mutated and you made antibodies for patch which is not there anymore, you then you no longer have protective immunity. Your antibodies are not going to work longer. So it's really interesting to potentially classify long COVID patients as long COVID Wuhan, long COVID Omicron, because they got sick to an Omicron variant, didn't have antibodies, and so it's hanging around. That would for me would be the simplest interpretation of the persistent virus yeah okay so should we have a look at um what what a normal result should look like this is actually quite a magic result this is a colleague of mine in the in the lab and she she had two astrazeneca jabs followed by a pfizer jab and she has made really good quant uh, quantities of antibodies on the left hand side there to all of the variants alpha delta wuhan look at it, it's a full house you don't need to look at anything more than the picture which says it's a full house. And on the right-hand side, they're all stunningly good quality antibodies as well. 60% of them are going to hang around for more than two hours across all the variants. So she swaggers around the lab a bit. She's got, um, uh, she's got this perfect response. And I think something like 25 to 35% of people have that. And that's so these from... are people who have the kind of, you know, just got some mild symptoms of shaking it off. and they've. But, but this will have been in your colleague, I believe this was due to vaccination rather than uh, because she's had a three vaccines? Yeah, so this was after the first booster and she, she ended up making a uh, antibodies to a patch of the variant that has survived all the variations. So she made it initially to the Wuhan variant, that was an in initial three vaccines. And she chose a patch on the surface of the spike protein that says, this is the one that works for me. And it seems to be there for all of the variants, which means no matter what she bumps into now, she's got good quality antibodies that are going to be made from the recipe she remembers. And so it's going to, uh, she'll, her antibodies will stick, will hang around for a couple of hours, and that lets them be cleared from the body. But if the virus mutates again a few times and there's another wave with a new variant, uh, there's no guarantee she's going to produce that same antibody response unless she gets vaccinated against that new variant. Is that fair to say? Yeah, so if the virus were to go into a different direction and the patch that she's made the antibodies to disappears, then that would be a problem. I do think there may be an Achilles heel to the vaccine around the spike protein because it has to have a hinge in it to go from being uh, pre-fused to fused with the cell, with the um, receptor. And if you break the hinge, <coughs> it's not going to work. So the vulnerability to, um, uh, to uh, uh, mutations in the hinge is too bad for the virus. But if you have to make an antibody to the hinge region, well, then maybe you have the perfect vaccine response and the perfect antibody response. 
So maybe there's an Achilles heel, and I'll show that in a picture later on, maybe. Okay, so let's talk about, let's look at a not perfect response. So this is a patient that um, had an infection uh, associated with Omicron, probably BA1 or 2 in the, in the region where we are. And we measured her <coughs> antibody spectrum after recovery, but the recovery was poor. She was sick for um, quite a few days with the initial infection. And then the long COVID symptoms persisted. She wasn't able to walk very far. She started using a wheelchair to get around. Uh, she was um, uh, suffering from POTS. So, so resting pulse rate was well over 140. And I think fitted many of the characteristics of having long COVID. So if she fit, if this fits in with my theory, this would be a long COVID persistent Omicron virus. And look, there's a gap here. There are very low concentrations of antibodies, and none of them are high quality. So none of the anti, no quality antibodies to the, the variant she saw, and nothing sticks. And so why why is this not hanging around in her body? So all I can say from my test is the antibodies don't stick to the variant that we think she was exposed to. And so that means her body may not be sterilized. So for about 18 months, this person has been suffering from long COVID symptoms and making little or no progress. And, the, but she had been vaccinated, is that right? Yes. But so had not produced good quality antibodies despite the vaccination. Yeah, so she made uh, Wuhan variant vaccine, <coughs> uh, Wuhan variant uh, from the vaccine. She made some antibodies. And uh, reasonable quality to Wuhan, about 40% uh, of them are stick for more than two hours. But the patch that she chose to make the antibodies to isn't there for the other variants. And she was then exposed to the Omicron variants here, and their anti her antibody recipe just didn't work. And for people who aren't vaccinated, the only way they would be able to produce antibodies is by encountering the virus or being infected by it. Is that correct? Yeah, so if you've seen the virus, and even if you don't get uh, symptoms, you may generate antibodies quickly, you will polish those, and it would have been sufficient for that to clear the, the virus from your body and, and, and get rid of the infection. So the natural course of infection is making good T cells to get rid of the acute infection, and then making good antibodies to clear the infection from the body. Okay, so I know that this is theoretical at the moment, and but you have measured this antibody response in what couple of hundred people now. What uh, are you yeah. seeing some patterns, or did you want did you want to maybe talk about this patient and what you did with her next? So let, let's let's talk about this patient because I think it's exciting. Um, about eight weeks ago, she um, got sick with um, uh, the circulating variant at the time, which was this XBB one five. And she went to her doctor and said, um, I would like to have some uh, antivirals because I'm immunocompromised and I'd like some support in getting rid of the infection. And the doctor said, well, how do you know you're immunocompromised? So uh, she showed the spectrum and the doctor said, OK, and gave her Molnupiravir, which is an antiviral. And that helped her get rid of the um, infection at the time. So the acute infection started to disappear. But over the period of about a week, her long COVID symptoms started to disappear as well. So I had a picture, uniquely, excitingly, um, of her antibody spectrum before infection and now after infection. So let's, this is a really busy slide. But if you look at the extreme right hand of both captions, there's a purple bar, which is really tall. And it's got high quality antibodies, around 80%, to XBB15, which is the variant she saw. And she made a reasonable good antibody concentration around four uh, milligrams per liter for that variant. But because her previous recipe, and this is my theory, her previous recipe didn't make antibodies to XBB15, she had to make them again. And in making them again, she chose a patch of the antibody that also was present in the persistent Omicron variant, uh, BA12. <clears throat> and look, she made good quality antibodies here under the Rack on the right-hand side, these are 80% of those are going to stick for more than a couple of hours. So what can I say here? I've got a before experiment when she had long COVID. She then got sick with the current uh, variant, and I measured the spectrum afterwards. And 
her long COVID symptoms though, fairly quickly over the period of about a week started to disappear. She recovered her brain fog disappeared and her cognitive reasoning improved. She got on the train and went to London the week afterwards without the wheelchair. And she would argue now that she's feeling nearly normal. So, But she crucially, she's also had some antivirals in that period. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the antivirals uh, attack the active virus. So if your virus is getting inside the cell and is, is uh, replicating, the antiviral goes in and kills the replicating um, DNA. Uh, so she had that. So that's clearly true that uh, the, uh, the antiviral may have uh, removed all active virus. Um, but uh, there was, there's, there's no evidence, I think, of active virus unless it's very low levels for the persistent variant that caused her long COVID. So again, concentrating on what I measured, she now has sticky antibodies, good quality antibodies to both the variant we think caused her long COVID and the one circulating at the moment. So she remade the recipe and now she's got better. So I, that before and after is really exciting. It, it could be a flash in the pan, it could, but it, and it's a correlation, but it, behind it, in my mind, there's a mechanism. That's the bit I find quite interesting. So this is really interesting. And I, I suppose I see a lot of patients who um, A, have never had access to antivirals and uh, and never will because long COVID is not deemed as one of the conditions, unfortunately, where you can get antivirals. Um, who uh, And the, the pattern I see in my long COVID patients is largely that reinfection absolutely floors them and makes them worse. Um, there are a few patients where I think vaccination has definitely improved their long COVID, but a lot of my patients' vaccination they makes them worse as well for a period of time. Um, and some people have, have been vaccine injured with long COVID, so I'm always a little bit cautious about the counselling around um, vaccination in my long COVID patients. So this, this feels, maybe I'm not seeing patients who are improving, um, but this feels unusual to me as a as a story. But unusual A that she's got she's got antivirals and B that she's recovered after a reinfection. But you know, I'm not I'm not doubting it's happened. It's just not what I'm seeing in my clinical practice. So I, I agree with you. Some some people make bad responses to the vaccine, so the messenger RNA vaccines in particular. There are some people online that are experimenting with Novavax, which is a protein vaccine, and are reporting some improvements. Um, so I don't think I've characterized enough people to be clear that the before and after is going to work for everybody. We are doing a di diagnostic accuracy study at the moment with some samples provided to us by Professor David Price from Cardiff. And not all long COVID patients have gaps in their spectra. But I do think there is maybe a subgroup of patients in this long COVID symptom that might have a, an explanation associated with having bad antibodies. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think when we look at when I look at the clusters of people I see in my clinic, I've got patients who very much look like they're mast cell driven, you know, allergy um, is predominant and they're, you know, rashes and asthma and hay fever. And then I have other patients who are very, very vascular. And what I don't know is, is all of this kind of a downstream effect of whatever's turning the inflammation tap on upstream, which, of course, could be viral persistent or it could be autoantibody driven. We just don't know enough. There just isn't enough clinical characterization going alongside the science, I don't think, at the moment. But viral persistence is obviously a, a, a theory which um, makes sense for other diseases as well, like people who have persistent symptoms after Epstein-Barr virus, or we were talking earlier about Lyme disease and um, dengue fever, et cetera. Let's, let's pick up so an autoimmune. Yeah, go on. Can I pick, can pick up an autoimmunity? So we mentioned that little patch at the beginning where the antibody measure, uh, recognizes the spike protein. If that little patch happens to be on a protein inside your heart and uh, it looks the same, such that the antibodies stick to it, then your immune system goes and attacks, attacks the protein in your heart or the protein in your uh, gut. So an autoimmune response where you start attacking yourself is another good mechanism, which as a biochemist I think is a, is a good uh, explanation for what might be happening but now there are two persistent virus is one hypothesis auto anti uh, antibodies autoimmunity is another we could try and test that but it's quite hard to screen for the moment my persistent virus test is 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 able to at least pick up these patients yeah and absolutely I, i'm seeing patients who have um random auto antibodies so they'll have a 
you sort of rheumatological autoantibody screen, the one that your rheumatologist would normally routinely do, mm -hmm. and one or two will be positive, but not in any quantities that rheumatology get excited about or that they're going to do anything about. So, right. uh, and then the patients who have been abroad and perhaps gone to, say, Germany and have had access to things like cell trend, where you can measure the G protein receptor coupled antibodies, the GPCR, they're quite often raised. So, these are antibodies against things like your beta 1 adrenoceptor and muscarinic um, receptors, which are important in that autonomic nervous system functioning. So, we are definitely seeing this autoimmune signal. I'd be really, I'd be really interested to see how that fits in with kind of what you're doing in your research program as well for me to measure that i'd have to have a um a, a protein in the test that was in your heart or in the in, in the um in the in the nerves and, and then we could try and see whether your your uh, antibodies stick to that protein so it would be possible to to look at a, a, a number of uh proteins from the nervous system and see whether there is accidental binding and if there is then that's going to recruit the immune system and that's going to cause um uh cell destruction and so would explain some of the symptoms associated with some of the other symptoms associated with, with the syndrome so i'm i'm conscious of, of time we've been going half an hour already i can't believe that um and i'm, I'm keen not to make these sessions too long because i know a lot of my patients and people watching might struggle with long bits of dialogue but in terms of the the million dollar question is how does this translate into potential treatments do you have um some theories around how antivirals could be used to help people with long covid and what work are you doing in that area so in collaboration with uh one of our partner clinics we um identified a patient that from our from our test that was wuhan um deficient so you can see here this is their spectrum the top here very small concentration of antibodies oh, add that to this, the screen yeah okay uh, and and where the golden arrow is, you can see that a low concentration of antibodies to Wuhan, but look, they're really low quality. And so sorry, the top one is the patient, and what's the bottom two graphs? The, the bottom one here is the patient after we gave them immunotherapy. Right. Sorry. So in, collabor in collaboration with the with the doctor, we took an immunotherapy that was developed for the early variants early on in the uh, pandemic for acute infections. So that said, if you had Wuhan, you were very unwell, you were in the hospital, uh, had a Wuhan infection, they would give you some immunotherapy ever showed. And that would then kill off that uh, variant. And so here we gave, we decided it wasn't acute infection, but it was a chronic infection persistent. We gave the ever to the patient. And you can see the antibody level goes up and the quality is not brilliant compared to the um, uh, serum we saw in the recovering patient. But nevertheless, we put some antibodies in their blood that were of higher quality. Now, this patient had really bad migraine uh, 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 frequency, had poor gut um, uh, function. All of those are associated with persistent virus in some way. And after the therapy, um, he began to get better. There's a problem with putting antibodies in the, in, the, in the blood and that you've got to squeeze hard to get them into the brain. But we did measure them in the brain, so we did know from the spectrum that in the CSF those antibodies are there. But I'm not sure the antibody quality is long enough, uh, is good enough. I'm not sure they lasted in complex for long enough. But we tried, and he has improved his long COVID symptoms. He is, has been on holiday a few times. Not better yet. But I think it's better than he was. And I'd like to see whether other immunotherapies could treat this. There's a new Evershell coming out next year that has a, a, an antibody uh, that has response to all the variants and antibody sticks to all the variants and that's really quite exciting so i think so andrew, andrew sorry to interrupt something strange has happened to the screen <laughs> uh, okay. i i think um we've sort of disappeared and the holding screen is on for some reason do you know it was all going so well can you can you still hear us helen can you nod because i can see you yeah so you can still hear us the, 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 the screen's just the screen's sort of gone and I've, I've no idea my technical guy is not on but if people are happy to just listen to us as chatting we can we can carry on um and helen if you could give um our technical guy a little oh he's on he's he's coming on to help rescue us let's carry on chatting and um and we'll we'll try and fix this oh there we go he's literally appears and sorts it out in in seconds thank you very much thank you um, sorry about that. So carry on, Andrew. I rudely interrupted you then, but um, I was keen that we sorted that out. What were you saying? 
So uh, the, we, we, we found the, um, the gap in this patient spectrum. We chatted to the clinician and made a uh, judgment call about whether the use of uh, the previous immunotherapy, Evershield, was uh, reasonable in this uh, patient. We gave him the immunotherapy. We showed that the drug got into his blood and into the liquid around, it, around his brain. And um, uh, he, is in, he has improved. His uh, baseline levels of activity are better. He's been on holiday a few times. His gut function has improved. And so now I've tried, we've tried in a patient a synthetic recovery serum that sort of matches the serum that we measured in the patient who made her own uh, recovery serum. There are some characteristics that are similar, but only in this class of patient where we have found a gap in the antibody spectrum do we think it's appropriate to try and give, give immunotherapy. So there is a chance that uh, we can plug the gap and then clear the persistent virus and then people will get better. And I would really like to then try and repair the gap by different, giving different types of vaccine to, um, as we saw earlier with Astra, Astra Pfizer, that produced a, a good biomark. Maybe the I'm seeing some really good data from the new uh, bivalent uh, vaccines that are seemingly make good, good at making good antibodies across our spectrum. So maybe there's a chance not only to fill the spectrum, fill the gap, make them better, but to repair the gap. So it's really early days. I've got a small number of data, uh, data points, uh, but I have a mechanism. I've made a measurement before and after. We've seen differences that correlate with improving non-COVID symptoms. So what's really important here is that the, the clinical history fits, um, that this is super physician supervised, so you're not treating people by yourself. You've got a team of clinicians who you're working with in London, and I think that's a really important thing to to say we're brought into this it is completely experimental so we, we at this moment in time it's not part of trial but obviously with with view to having a, a trial of this we have got a, a trial starting at the university of derby actually of IV remdesivir so i think this the whole idea of antivirals in in long covid long overdue um but is gaining traction slowly um what's your kind of what's your goals over the next 12 to 24 months and why can't we do this via the nhs and via via the kind of you know funding streams that are, are available um you know at the moment this is all having to be done really um through the private private system isn't it and patient-led people are buying tests people are paying for therapies because there's nothing available so what i'd like to do now is the the, the trial in derby it would be very good to do a before and after uh, spectrum uh, for the patients participating there. And there's a, a really good immunotherapy uh, for us, an experimental antibody in University of San Francisco with David Petrino. I'd love to do some before and after spectra there. If we could build enough coincidental um, before and after spectra where recovery happened, then we have diagnostic. If you have a diagnostic, then we can look at companion therapies and the disease changes from a whole list of, uh, of uh, symptoms in a syndrome to something that is better characterized. At that point, we can then make the case to the drug manufacturers to maybe sponsor a trial and maybe make the case to government to say, this has now got a diagnostic and if uh, the diagnostic is used properly, we can make people better. So I think if we make the case for the, um, from my point of view as a biochemist, from it, for it, being, from it being mechanistic, then maybe we can persuade government to have a go and, and, and jump in and fix it. And what, one in 30 people now in the UK have this problem. We're about to go into the winter, which is going to be mixed with flu, RSV and COVID, as well as some bacterial infections, maybe. And um, one in 30 people take multiply by the population of India or America is a large number of people. We can treat some of them because the science fits. We shall. So I'd love to collect data. We'll publish it properly. We'll get a period and see if that can be the basis for an interventional trial. Yeah, no, that, that sounds really interesting. We could certainly um, link you with uh, Mark Fahey at Derby University, who's who's doing that that trial. That'd be great if that could come out of our conversation this evening to do some yeah. additional testing. Um, just a couple of final points before we go to sort of um, any public questions. Um, what would you say to the people, at the moment patients are having to pay for this test, what would you say to people who are like, oh, well, here's another person who's fleecing people with long COVID who are desperate and uh, just trying to make a, a buck off the back of it? What would you say to those people? 
I would say that we invested the money donated by the alumni in, in making research work. We got a PhD student that was sponsored by the company that uh, spent the last uh, uh, six months of his PhD investigating this. So Atomarca has put a lot of effort in and, and capital into making this work. The test is um, uh, experimental and so needs to be approved by a doctor. It's a little expensive, but um, so few people are taking it at the moment. <coughs> we can probably reduce the price when, when the numbers go up. But for the moment, I funded all of this through various sources within the company and within the research group. And uh, I have to recover some of those to make it available. I want to make it CE marked and maybe FDA approved, and then it can be sold properly. But if we're going to get to everybody and test 60 million people, we're going to have to have the necessary commercial credentials to supply the test and make sure it works internationally. So at some point, it has to be commercialized. It just so happens it's, it's our idea, and it, it only works in our instrument at the moment. And um, final, <coughs> final comment, I think, um, talking about vaccines and long COVID, um, it's a tricky one because I think, you know, if you're healthy and, and, and uh, you, you're eligible for a vaccine, I think absolutely it's the right thing to do. And you've given us lots of examples here of, of why, um, why it will protect you. Um, in my patients with long COVID, as I say, I get a really mixed bag of results. Um, and that, you know, so it's some patients, and we don't know, this isn't characterised very well, but I would say in a region of about 25%, definitely have an adverse reaction, get worse for, for a while. And some people, um, you know, a permanent worsening. Other people can't put a figure on it who report a improvement and other people who are absolutely fine. And we don't have any way of predicting who's going to react um to to vaccine in what way and i and because there just isn't any work in this area and i think if we had a test where we could predict who's gonna have a good response or a bad response that would be really helpful is that something you've thought about or is that something you could could think about i guess I'm putting you on the spot now <laughs> <laughs> i like the idea of a companion diagnostic we measure before you do something and you, we measure after and see if we can measure a change I like the idea of recruiting people into the intervention. So if they are going to respond badly to the vaccine, maybe they have very bad antibodies across the spectrum. Maybe they are immunocompromised. Giving them another challenge seems to me to be a risk. And so we would make the scientific measurement and then leave it to the clinical judgment. But you're right. I think we just need information. And people are ultimately complex and the therapy needs to be personalized. You need This virus can be everywhere inside your body and will perturb and change all of your body systems. And we just need to know what's appropriate for the person. Actually, I think personalised medicine is the future. We need to treat everybody as individuals. Um, fantastic. So thank you very much, Andrew. We've got a few questions coming in from the audience now. Um, I'm just going to pop this one up, which has come from Imre Kiss, um, who's asked, what form of immunotherapy did you use for your patients? Name of drugs. I think you mentioned Evershield earlier. Is there anything else you're using? So we gave uh, the patient uh, Evershield and Paxlovid um, in case the uh, immunotherapy uh, triggered the viral uh, activation. And we gave that three times so that we let the antibody levels rise. Um, and I wanted to get to a high concentration to get it from the blood into the brain, across the blood-brain barrier. Then we let the antibody levels fall a bit and gave it again. So Evershield was uh, our second choice. I wanted to use Sotrovimab, but the government has all the Sotrovimab in the UK, and I wasn't able to get access to that. <clears throat> Sotrovimab has slightly different characteristics on the, on the back of the antibody, which might make it better for clearance. So for choice, I would have chosen Sotrovimab. The new antibody in the trial in uh, the, the U San Francisco is really interesting. If that works, then that's good, as would Evershell 2. So I would like to, I'd like to try more with Sotrovimab and look at the spectral properties of these new immunotherapies as they come out, and then we can choose them. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, so we've got a question from Yanto Evans. Um, great question. You can't see it. I don't know if you can see it all, but it says, are there any indications as to how the virus will behave over time? Will its potency wane or will it mutate into new variants where we will need to adapt the way we track and treat symptoms, I guess, without grazing into your crystal ball? I, you know, I suppose the past predicts the future, doesn't it, Andrew? And what could you, could you make a comment on that? 
it's hard, isn't it? It looks like the virus is stuck in some sort of Omicron variant. Um, it is crossing with various other um, types at the moment, so it might go back and become more Delta-like or more Wuhan-like. That seems somewhat unlikely, and I think the we're banking the idea that it will become um, maybe infectious but not dangerous, and then, then it becomes endemic. Uh, the chances of it doing something nasty are not impossible. Also, when you get infected, you could brew up your own variant inside you, and that's where the Kent variant came from. And uh, it's possible that somebody may then generate something that's quite nasty, and then that gets spread around. I think it looks like it's stuck in the Omicron glade, as it's called, and maybe it'll stay there. Yeah, and I, I suppose the other critical thing is that our antibodies, both from inf infection, but also from <clears throat> vaccination, do wane over time, and that will be different in different people, presumably. Um, so having a way to quantify the antibody response just seems like a really sensible thing to have uh, as a tool to help us manage the pandemic so, as it goes on. So I, I mentioned the hinge, and I do think if we could get a vaccine that targeted the hinge, then that is always going to work against all variants because I think that's the Achilles heel. And then there is a chance that we can raise immunity. Then there's a chance we can beat it. <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, yes, antibodies levels wane over time. If you've got the wrong recipe, then you'll make bad antibodies and you'll get sick. Yeah. Yes. And I think I think we do need better vaccines. Um, I mean, the mRNA vaccines did an absolute incredible job at a time where we desperately needed them but i think moving forwards using this kind of technology and um testing before and after and as you say developing new vaccines against the hinge would you know seems like the way forward but i don't know if anyone's really doing that globally i, I, I have no idea novavax claims to make antibodies across all known variants at the moment which means it's okay. found a conserved epitope a conserved patch I think we should look at that. It's also a protein, so it's in your arm for longer. It's not clear by the T cells. And it's also not a uh, genetic message adding de debris to your arm. So I quite like a more conventional vaccine now. So an earlier uh, rapid response with the messenger RNA vaccines followed by a more conventional protein vaccine follow-up feels an yeah. interesting mechanism to me. And of course, Novavax is another thing that none of us can access, um, certainly not in the UK, very easily. Um, I've, I'm, I'm yet to find anyone who's been able to get hold of it. Again, if I get a good body of evidence together with some publications, I'll approach Novavax, the Chief Medical Officer, and see what they say. Sure. Now, I've got a very specific sounding question uh, from um, somebody called Doctor, who <laughs> I'm assuming has got some scientific background. Um, so understanding from Shane Crotty's lab was that T-cell epitopes were conserved, meaning antibodies bound across variants. Hard to make out which part of your work was hypothesis versus hard results. Um, is that a fair comment? So T cells have um, messages uh, that are from ver various viral proteins inside the cell, and they're longer. They're about 16 units long, whereas the antibody response to bits are only six units long. So I think the T cells are likely to be more durable and, and against all variants. The bit that I've clearly shown is that the antibodies are varying in their ability to stick. There's no question about the measurement. For me, it's about whether my hypothesis translates into recovery. And we've tested that with one patient that got themselves better and made better antibodies and one patient that got a little bit better with some immunotherapy. So I agree, I'm measuring science. I'm measuring how the antibodies stick to the spike protein. That's hypothesis driven, and I haven't killed the hypothesis yet. So scientifically, it still stands. Yeah, and I, I personally think that where we're going to end up with in terms of managing long COVID will be um, personalised treatment based on the person's symptoms, these biomarker profiles. So we'll have some patients who need the anti-clotting treatment, we'll have some people who need their leaky gut fixed, we'll need some people who need the mast cell treatment, we'll need some people who need antivirals, and then there'll be some people who need combination of the above. Um, and you know, it feels like we're so far off that personalized medicine um, approach, even though there's so much research going on in different parts of the world, it's like bringing it all together and doing these big studies where we're measuring them in people. Um, now, Andrew, you've frozen on my screen. Can you still hear me? 
I can hear you. Yes, it's a lovely you've picture just, of me. Through, isn't it? You've ju you've ju <laughs> let me just remove you and bring you back. See if that unfreezes your face. No, you're still stuck in this kind of um, <laughs> slightly surprised um, manner. So I think that's probably a good time to wrap things up, actually, because we've been going for 50 minutes. Um, can you still hear us, Andrew? Now I've lost him. Um, well, there we go. It's come to come to a natural um, end. So uh, I just want to say a massive thank you, really. I mean, it's great to see so many of you live online, but do um, do share this amongst networks as well if you found it helpful. Uh, Prof Shaw, um, uh, unfortunately, has been... Oh, I think he's back. Let me bring you back on. I was going to ask you if there's other sort of specific questions, whether either we can do a follow-up Q&A at some point, um, or if there's a few that people want to, you know, once they've had a chance to watch it, if they come through to me or Helen, um, we can maybe do something as a follow up. I haven't really thought about that. It just popped into my head like literally this second. <laughs> so, but would you be willing to? I guess that's the question. If lots of lots of people are prepared to try the test and we collect the data and then prepared to be part of the study, then yes, of course. Let's let's. let's uh... <laughs> All right, there's a, there's a little there's a little okay, that's fine. Yeah. To be honest, the 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 test you say it's expensive, but when you look at the amount of money people are spending on supplements and various other things and traveling here and traveling there, it's actually not um, in the grand scheme of things. But uh, you know, it's never ideal where you have to pay for stuff. But um, it is what it is at the moment, and I know you are looking very hard at uh, grant funding to to try and make this um, accessible for everybody. Um, so a massive, massive thank you to you for the work you are doing and showing an interest in this area and innovating and doing something different. There's lots of thank yous coming up in the chat. So, um, you know, we really appreciate what, you, what you're doing um, and watch this space. And maybe in, in 12 months, 24 months, we can come back together and hopefully <laughs> talk about where things have gone to. Love to, of course. Brilliant. So that wraps things up for tonight. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. So the next session is going to be on December the 13th. And I've got Dr. Sanjay Gupta lined up, who many of you will know is one of our leading uh, cardiologists in the UK. He's looking after hundreds of patients with POTS and long COVID. So we are going to have a chat about what we can do in very practical terms about managing POTS. It's a big topic. Um, but we'll do our best to cover the key points. Uh, so that's it from me. I'm just going to bring Helen back on just to, sorry, Helen, <laughs> just completely dro dropped you dropped you in there. But thanks for everything you're doing in the background to make this happen. And a massive thanks to the Long COVID support charity and team who are all really poorly and just working so hard for the community. All right, take care. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.